Welcome to Games Lounge episode two. We're back. If you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe and leave your feedback in the comments below. We're going to jump straight in with the news. Take it away, Frank. Hello there, world. It's your boy, Frank, and welcome to another episode of Games Lounge. Now, I'm here to wrap up what happened last month, and mostly what happened last month is I played around with my Nintendo Switch and my PlayStation VR. Now, first up, we'll go over some Nintendo Switch. Now, lately, I've been hopping into my Mario Kart and zooming this way and that way with my baby Monica. We play just about every night, and last night, we stayed up until about 5 a.m. because we just couldn't put it down. If you haven't picked up Mario Kart 8 Deluxe for the Switch, it's awesome. At first, I thought I'd mind those little controllers in my hand driving the cars, but hell no, it's too much fun. You gotta get that one. Also, we had the global test fire for Splatoon 2. I watched a bunch of videos, but sadly I was at work during all the times, so I couldn't really play. It looks great and I'm excited for it to come out. I just know that the date's a little ways away. Now, PlayStation VR wise, puzzle games were what happened in this month. Statics top notch. Love that one, been playing that mostly recently. Before that, we had a handful of other wonderful games, but too many for me to remember. We got so many new ones coming next month. Far points hitting us, too cool. Also, before I forgot, I hope everybody had a wonderful Easter. I haven't had a chance to talk to you in a little while, and I hope you're doing great. Now, back to gaming for a second. First person shooters are something that I haven't jumped into in a while. I've been stuck in VR, but with some of the great ones on the horizon, I might have to take a break for a little bit. Battlefront 2 is coming out, and I am sure they're going to have some kind of VR component, so I know I'm going to be grabbing an at one. Looks great, but I hope it doesn't suffer from the same issues I had with Battlefront 1. It was just too easy. I mean, maybe that's a tactic to get more players involved, but to me, it's not really what I'm trying to do. I love Battlefield, I love Star Wars, and I want a little more difficulty in my game. Also, the new Call of Duty looks all right. I haven't really been into Call of Duties in a while, and I think that they heard people's thoughts and brought it back in time, which is cool, but I hope they do it right, and it's not just some crummy little cash grab stringing for hope in a Call of Duty franchise, because the last Battlefield World War was amazing. All right, now one thing that I didn't get but I heard about this month were those little mini NESs. They got discontinued. I was hoping to grab one and I'm sure price is only gonna skyrocket. What are you doing, Nintendo? You know people love these. I mean, maybe it was difficult to put out and maybe there was too much attraction to that and possibly you didn't want people to buy those and you prefer them to buy Switches, but I mean, come on, people love these things. I have a strong feeling we're gonna get all these retro games on a Switch coming out soon in a kind of sort of bundle pack just to make up for the fact that there's no mini NES because basically your Switch could become a mini NES. And finally, to wrap things up, we got to hear a little more about the Xbox Scorpio. Now, I don't think your boy Frank's gonna be hopping ship anytime soon, but I have a strong feeling that the Scorpio is gonna be VR compatible. I did hear that if they do VR, it's gonna be open source, so there's a good chance that Sony's gonna get everything that they get as well which means I don't really gotta worry. I'm sure it's gonna be a wonderful system. Most of these future consoles are pretty great, but Xbox in the past didn't seem to know how to prioritize. It looks like Sony may be suffering from similar issues lately with PlayStation VR with a number of experiences coming out that aren't so great. But the other day, we got a chain smokers experience that have changed my thoughts on music video experience. Very cool, actually interactive, and we got it for free. I'm glad that Sony listened a little bit. And finally, next month is going to be amazing, and I'm going to be back with all the top stories that interest me. 
as always, it's your boy Frank Mon signing out. And hey, have a great day. So that was Frank looking back at the month in games. And next up, we've got Sean who'll be looking at some controllers in Tech Bytes. These are kind of the standard controllers that come with the consoles themselves. And I just want to go over a little bit about each of them. The main focus is the Switch one because this is the controller that I was a little bit kind of dissuaded with the pictures of it. It looked a little bit bulky. But after using Anton's, I was instantly sold and I bought it straight away. So I want to go over some of the cool features about this. This here, obviously, this controller is the PlayStation 4 controller. You get this with the PlayStation 4 Pro. It's got the gunmetal finish color, so it looks a little bit more sleeker than the original one. This comes with a touchpad, so you've now got the touchpad. And on the new version of this, this one here, has got the extra light bar. So when you're playing like this, normally you would only see the color here, which changes depending on what user is playing the controller. But you've now got a light bar on the top here, the lights up as well. In the hands, the controller feels quite good. It feel, feels quite comfortable. I think this is my favorite DualShock 4 controller, DualShock controller. I was never keen on the originals. I've never been a big fan of the analog sticks down here, the symmetrical design, and the D-pad as well. I've never been a big fan of the D-pad. The Xbox One controller, this was my favorite controller. I thought it felt great in the hands. The analog sticks in this one, they're quite nice. They've got a little rubberized grip texture, so they're nice to push at the sides. They feel fairly sturdy. These actually loosened up from the original Xbox 360 controller, where they, these were a lot stiffer. These are a little bit looser now, and the PlayStation 4 was the exact opposite way. They used to be a lot looser. They are now a lot stiffer to push. The Xbox One controller has got the analog triggers, which have actually got rumble in the triggers as well. So on certain games, you will feel a different rumble in these triggers themselves, which is pretty cool. I'd almost call it 3D rumble. So although the Switch has got its HD rumble, the Xbox One has got a kind of 3D rumble, which is pretty cool. They're a pendulum style. They're like a weighted counterweight pendulum. So they'll spin on the motor and it gives you that weight and that's what gives you the vibration. This also has motion controls and it can be used for the, for the stuff with the VR. The Xbox doesn't have motion uh, controls, but it's got the extra rumble features, like I said. Coming to the Switch Pro controller, I think this is probably ergonomically my favorite out of the controllers. I think the way your hand rests on the triggers is much easier to get these. It's, it's just as good as the PlayStation 4's controller, the DualShock 4, so it's really easy to use, whereas on the Xbox One controller, I find that I'm having to cramp my fingers a little bit or rotate my hand just to get that pressure on the button. Now, it has got the new D-pad, so unlike the, the Joy-Cons, where it's a split design like the PlayStation 4 a little bit, but with rounded buttons, this is one actual body, and it's got the left, right, up and down. So this is more like your NES or SNES type D-pad, and it is quite stiff, but I think that'll loosen up with time. And possibly for fighting games, this is probably better designed than something like the Split Design or the Joy-Cons. The buttons themselves have got a nice texture. The look of this one here is also my favorite controller now as well. I think this see-through body works really, really nice. Inside the controller, there's loads of articles about this. Nintendo put a hidden message, thanks to all gamers. I think that's awesome, just a nice little bonus. Extra with the controller here though, you can put your Amiibos in this, so it has got a near-field communication device in the controller itself. It is on the right-hand side stick, so like your Joy-Cons, you can just take your Amiibo and you can press it on the, the right analog stick and that will send your Amiibos. So that's built into it and it has got motion controls like the DualShock 4. The rumble is also a little bit different. This is the Nintendo's HD rumble. It's a little bit different from the other ones. This uses, it's a linear device uh, rumble. So kind of similar to what's in the Oculus Rift. I have heard people saying that the Joy-Cons, because they're separated and they're smaller, you feel the rumble a lot more in the Joy-Cons than you do in the main controller. That's about £40 or $50. Same with the Xbox One controller, it's £40 or $50. The only unfortunate thing with this, with the Switch one, is it's about £60 here in the UK. Like I said, you are getting that NFC reader built into there. I think the rumble is a little bit more advanced, so you're getting that little bit extra. But on top of this, the Xbox One needs batteries or a battery pack, which you buy separately. The DualShock 4, you would charge this up and it lasts for, I've seen anything from about three and a half hours to 11 hours. The Switch Pro controller though, has got a built-in battery as well, but this one lasts for up to 40 hours. That's the kind of average time, and it will vary depending on what game you're playing. The extra battery life, the NFC in this, 
that's what's getting the extra cost on this controller. And I really would recommend, it's difficult to see in the pictures how good this is, get a shot of one if you can, or get one in your hands and feel it, it's really, really nice. The only downside to this controller is the triggers are not analogs, so these are just digital triggers. Instead, you're probably gonna to have to get another controller for those games for Virtual Console if it comes out eventually. But all three controllers, I think Nintendo's kept themselves in the game here with the controllers, all amazing. I'd love to see the prices come down to about £30 for each controller. And then you've got the Pro Controllers, the Elite Elite Controllers. Let us know what you think about the controllers if you've got it yourself. What you like about the Pro Controller. What's your favourite controller. And we'll see you next episode. If you love gaming, we think you'll love Gamify 24-7. That is Small Fry Unify's weekly gaming podcast. Check out on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and now we're also available on YouTube. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the chat section with myself and Kat. Hi. And this episode we're going to be talking about a little bit more in depth about the Xbox Scorpio. But I want to go over some of the specs that they're talking about. What does it really mean and is Microsoft in a good position with the Xbox Scorpio? It's going to be true 4K gaming, 6 teraflops GPU, it's got a 2.3 gigahertz custom CPU, 1 terabit hard drive storage, 12 gigs of GDDR5 memory, 326 gigabits memory bandwidth, HDR and 4K UHD Blu-ray DVDs. So it looks great on the specs side of it, but what are you really thinking about yourself, Kat? What's your thoughts on that? Does it does it stand out? Is it making you interested in an Xbox Scorpio? Like it's really cool because I'm like that sounds kind of like a mid-range PC yeah. in a little in a little box. Um, for console gamers but at the same time I'm not someone if I was really really interested in specs and keeping up to date on that kind mm. of thing then I would just flash out for a PC because I feel like with the games being cheaper and mm. everything like that and the wide wider range of games yeah I'd probably rather just do that so I, d I don't know how many people it will actually sway just by seeing the hardware how yeah. many console gamers that will actually sway because You'd need like a proper TV mm. and everything as well for it. Yeah, 4K TV. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I think clearly they're trying to compete with like the PS4 Pro in that sense, but also I I still am not sure where this all fits in. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what they're trying to do here with it. I know they're they're sort of saying they're kind of trying to get out of the whole having a long lifespan for a generation of consoles mm -hmm. and then. They're, they're just trying to make it so that you've got like a family of consoles and you can just pick which one you have mm -hmm. and they'll all have the same games and stuff, but... There's mm. a big part of it coming down to price then. Like, yeah. I, like I know we've talked about the games. I think that's that's a given. It needs the games to work. But on the specs alone, yeah, it's looking like a PC, a powerful PC. Maybe not quite as powerful as current PCs are out there, but a pretty decent PC and a super powerful console. But if it comes out... Now, there is a rumour that there was a site that posted up a price of less than, I think it was a German site or something. Yeah, it was about $399. If it came out for that, would that make a big difference? Is it more, we're thinking along the lines of a PC, if it came out at £700, say, what the rumours were talking about, that's just way too high. But if it's 300, yeah. 350 would that do it for you? I would definitely be tempted, but like purely because that sounds really, really impressive mm. and I guess, it would be an upgrade technically for me because I've just got a PS4 at the mm. moment. It would definitely be a hardware kind of upgrade. But at the same time, they're talking about it. They've, they've said that it will run Xbox One games as well. Yeah. But the reason I've not got an Xbox One is because I don't think there are enough games that There's I want no to play. There's no games to run. <laughs> so I'm kind of like, this seems like a they're trying to solve this problem, but I don't really think they've mm. got it quite yet. Yeah. I don't really know what they're trying to do here. Touching upon that as well, the fact that it is going to be backwards compatible with the Xbox One games, or the idea is that it's only, it has to run both the Xbox One and the Scorpio games. Anton mentioned this in the podcast about a bottlenecking potential development. So yeah, you've got all this capability there, but if you're having to develop for both, hopefully the tech is there that you can scale it down and it's not an issue. Yeah. But if it starts restricting developers where they're saying, well, you know, I have to develop this for the original Xbox owners, so I can't really do this, I can't do that. Uh -huh. Is that going to be a, like a problem with it as well? Yeah, because like they, as I say, they've said that you will be, they will be playing Xbox One games on it. Somebody was quoted as saying, they were like, will there be just exclusives through the Scorpio? 
and the person said, I'm really bad at remembering names, so I don't know who it was. Basically, that's up to developers. Yeah. They're not making it particularly with loads of Xbox Scorpio exclusives in mind because mm -hmm. they're trying to kind of stop this idea that it's a new generation or a new, a whole new console. Mm -hmm. I think it's because they know how annoyed people are going to get yeah. uh, when this new thing comes out and they'll be like, well, why did I bother buying the Xbox One? Which is yeah. what we originally kind of thought when it was announced. I was like, what's the point? Well, well we talked about this last year. Me and Kat were talking about this in Series 2. And that's one of the things we said. There's the, the idea of buyer's remorse, where you buy your console for 400, 500 pound, and then a couple of years later, there's another iterated version of it. And it's like, well, I'm kind of reluctant now to buy some of these devices. You know, I bought the PlayStation 4 Pro here for the studio, and the only reason why I went with the Pro is because I didn't have a PlayStation 4. And I did get rid of the Xbox One S because we got the PlayStation 4 Pro, and I thought there was nothing really exclusive for it that made me want to keep it. And now with the Xbox Scorpio, I feel like I'm still in the same position. I don't want to trash on the Wii U too mm. much here, but I that didn't go down too well mm. with people. And I'm not a big Nintendo fan or anything, but there was clearly a problem there, whereas versus the Switch has come out and there's one game that everybody loves and it's mm. Zelda. And that's why it's selling yeah. so well, yeah. because people want to play Zelda on the Switch. That's kind of where they need to learn, I think, for mm. the Xbox because the Xbox 360 had so many good exclusives and it had just such a wide variety of games. If the Scorpio comes out and all it is is just, you can play Xbox One games, but in higher definition, mm. I'm not Even caring. higher definition. Even higher, <laughs> with all the teraflops and everything, I just, I just don't care. Yeah. That's not, I'm, I don't want to have to pay 300 or as the rumours probably would be like five, 600 pounds mm. at least for that. And I don't even think VRs, it's not going to come out with a VR headset or anything, yeah, is it? That's separate. It's VR yeah. capable, yeah. but there won't be a headset or anything like that. What games would they need at the E3 conference to convince you to buy it? Stuff that's not just a sequel, like no more Halo, probably no more Gears of War. If they came out with some exclusives that were really, really good, like with 360, Gears of War was obviously exclusive, and so was Bioshock at the time mm. when it first came out. Mass Effect as well. So if they can kind of get these new titles, new franchises like that, I would be like, oh, this is actually really exciting. This is probably going to be coming out at the end of this year. So we've still got a good good while to go before it comes out. Is there a chance that behind the time this comes out, maybe <laughs> in August or something, that Sony comes in and says, yeah, we've got an next console. <laughs> and then it's just wipes off the I genuinely had that thought. Yeah. Like, I've been thinking it, like... My mind just drifts to hearing more about it at E3. They'll have a big reveal and probably showcase a lot of the games that are going to be mm. available and things like that. They're going to really have to pull it out of the bag, though, I think. Yeah. Then I think, though, Sony always seems to do so much better, especially in recent years, than Xbox. Mm -hmm. What on earth are they going to do this year? And I'm still confident they're going to pull something out that's going to be better than that. I'm, like I said, I'm on the fence about whether I want to even buy it. It comes down to the games. But the... The fact that we've had these mid-cycle generation consoles and several versions of them now with the Xbox One S, the Scorpio, the PlayStation 4 Pro, the Slims, all this kind of stuff. I feel like there's, they've done it far too early. I wish they had have just held off and let's say the end of this year, if we had got the PlayStation 4 Pro and maybe the Scorpio, at that point, I would have felt, maybe felt a little bit more inclined to support them. There must be something else there. Microsoft must have something else. It can't surely just be about all the tech. But you, if you've got the original Xbox One S or Xbox One, mm -hmm. you can then do a, an upgrade program. And maybe for maybe that's where it is three hundred pounds you upgrade, but you're getting a console yeah. worth about seven hundred pounds. Yeah, because when I kind of saw the sort of six hundred pound was people's estimations of how much, mm. just from purely from the hardware, how much this would be viable for them to sell it for. When I get a new phone, mm. the phone probably would be retail value of about six hundred pounds. Yeah. Like a new iPhone is oh, yeah, easy. Oh yeah, seven hundred, yeah, eight hundred pounds, yeah. But people get them immediately as soon as they come out. People queue to get them. If that's how much they were kind of wanting to get for these consoles, I was like, surely they're gonna have to break it down for people because mm. it's just not viable to try and sell a console for that much money. Like even if it is Christmas, yeah. people still are even gonna... so quickly after the other ones. Exactly. So I feel like. It would be an interesting twist, and I think it would actually change the way that this is done now. Yeah. 
if people are going to start putting consoles out every year, every two years. That's what we think about the Scorpio. We're looking forward to E3. We'll get much more information. Stay tuned. We've got the competition coming up for next month. And we've also got Connor's review coming up for Persona 5. If you want a chance of winning the prizes here in this competition, head over to patreon.com forward slash small fry unify, support us on Patreon, and you will have a chance at winning some of these cool, awesome prizes. Persona 5 is brash, in your face, and cranks every aspect of it to 11. I love it. When playing Persona 5, I'm reminded of the games I play in childhood. Not because I've played this series since then, but because it feels like a wholesome and complete adventure. A fantasy worthy of your time to soak in the details and appreciate it for the piece of art it is. From the very moment you boot up this game, there will be nothing but visual delights. The environments, the menus, the dungeons, the beautiful animated cutscenes, even the button prompts. I can't begin to say enough for the flair Persona 5 gives off at every single angle. It's probably the best art design I've seen from a game in years, and I don't say that lightly. It also helps that the concept for the Persona games are so strong to begin with. The idea of exploring a person's inner mind and fighting through that same mind using an array of personas, a powerful physical embodiment of a person's true identity, paves way for a neat twist on traditional JRPG combat systems as well as potential for good narrative. That potential does not go to waste here. It helps so much that the characters are not only well acted, but also grounded in realism. It contrasts nicely with the much more abstract main plot of exploring someone's hidden desires. I won't spoil anything, but the plot twist that occurs later on was genuinely a stroke of genius. There are two main goals of the game, socializing with other people to learn of their troubled lives and utilising your persona to battle in dungeons. The dungeon ends when you steal a person's heart, forcing them to admit their crimes. The constant overlapping between these goals are what glues the experience so well. This is mainly thanks to the confident mechanic. It's used to spend time with ours and learn more about them. Each confident empowers you with additional abilities for use in battle. So basically, the more you bond with ours, the more adept at combat you are. This is a major step up from the previous game, Persona 4, as it all too often felt like anyone outside of your immediate friends were not really worth the time to socialise with. It's a good thing that the player has so many options, since the battle system has become more involved. Guns make a return, giving very limited ammunition, but also a nice ranged attack. The baton pass feature is amazing. After downing an enemy, you can pass to an ally you've bonded with enough to use a second, even stronger attack. The player also now has access to backup members that can be swapped at will, even during battle. The best returning feature is capturing a persona. Instead of Persona 4, where you just try to draw the right card after a battle, it actually correlates with the existing mechanics by allowing you to weaken enemies in battle, haggle with them, and convince them to join your cause. Admittedly, there is still an element of luck here, as it can be difficult at times to ascertain exactly what dialogue is correct, but it's never a big deal since there are alternate ways to capture them. The dungeons themselves are great, capitalising on handcrafted motifs for each of the many disturbed characters on offer. Furthermore, the varied puzzles between each locale kept things fresh, even if some lacked the challenge I was hoping for. Despite that comment, I advocate the journey through each dungeon is well worth it. The new addition of a stealth mechanic used to ambush enemies has a nice feeling to the way in which you smoothly transition from place to place. Unfortunately, the camera movement is limited, meaning it's difficult to reach places which really should be accessible. It's not a huge issue overall, since the dungeons use mostly linear rooms, but as soon as it opens up, it can become problematic. 
that is honestly my biggest fault with the game. The only other issues I had were relatively minor. Some of the English dialogue felt a bit stock at times, with phrases being repeated a bit too often, but never enough to become that annoying. It would also be nice if Personas, other than the active one, received experience to mitigate the grinding. But since you can fuse Personas into more powerful ones, I can easily let it slide. Finally, the main character's stat system got to me a little at times too. The idea being that by practicing certain tasks, you will increase your ability to be confident, intelligent, etc. Realistically, however, it's just a way to gate the player off from performing certain actions that otherwise don't feel justified enough to be so. The reason it doesn't come off badly is because the actions you perform to increase these stats tend to be enjoyable. Besides, you can fast forward everything in this game, so even if you don't enjoy it, it isn't an issue. What a fantastic job Soji Meguro has done with the soundtrack. It's so often sublime and catchy, melting into the backdrop to paint a beautiful canvas of your day-to-day -day moments. The weapon shop theme especially deserves a shout out for its eerie build-up. Still, I don't think anyone can argue that traveling to the final bosses and hearing the track Life Will Change is anything other than adrenaline pumping. Persona 5 is successful because it knows exactly what it is. It's staunchly focused on its goal, never succumbing to limiting its potential and always ready to flaunt itself for all to see. It's a true refinement to the core of what makes the series not only unique, but fun. This culminates in an unforgettable experience that personally, I believe is absolutely worthy of your time. Let us know what you thought of this review and your own impressions of the game in the comments below. That was Connor's review of Persona 5. Let us know what you think of the game. Join us next time when we're going to be discussing our predictions for E3. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching.